Welcome in episode 199, What's Right with Nick Wright. And before we get started, let me remind you guys about my friends at Airbnb. I love and use Airbnb all the time. Whether it's a work trip or for a vacation, I'm always looking for the best places to stay. And maybe you yourself have also stayed in Airbnb before and thought, this actually seems pretty doable. Maybe my place could be an Airbnb. It could be as simple as starting with a spare room or your whole place when you're away. Either way, you could be sitting on an Airbnb and not even know it. Maybe you're traveling to see friends and family for the holidays. While you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Whether you could use extra money to cover some bills or something, a little more fun your home might be worth more than you think find out how much at airbnb.com slash host all right so this is we have a massive show planned for today for a number of reasons for uh our poker loving audience uh i have a pretty epic poker story from my trip to the atlantis resort in the bahamas for the world series of poker paradise that's coming up Last week, we, Demonze and I shared our experience of watching Chiefs Packers at Lil Wayne's house, and I realized I forgot the single best thing that happened there, that I don't know if Demonze knows what I'm referring to right now, but the moment I start telling the story, we have to have a split screen, screen because the look on Dem Demonze will instantly know what I'm referring to, and if his face will tell the story, it is not at all a bad story for you, pal. But you are, I, it is, it, I could not believe I didn't tell it. So we have that. We have the controversy from the Chiefs. LeBron's won, you know, his fifth ring, one shy of Michael now. Those are just the numbers. Sorry, guys. Five champions. Five championships to six championships. That's just the math. We have to discuss that and Monday Night Football. But before we get to any of that, usually... By 10.20 a.m., I'm or 10.25 a.m. Eastern, I'm sitting in this seat wrapping up my TV meeting, and then we do some tech stuff and get the show going. Today, as it happened, my mom called me, and my mom called me to do like some, uh, ask some Christmas questions, so I walked outside to speak with her. As I'm outside, uh, and I'm getting, getting ready to get off the phone with my mom, uh, I hear my name called and there's a fellow wearing a Chiefs beanie and I'm like, oh, a Chiefs fan. That's what's up. So I say hi. And then I, I discover that the fellow's name is Danny. His wife's name is Rachel. Their four daughters are here. They are in from Little Rock, Arkansas, spending some holiday time in New York City and two of their big things they wanted to do was go see the Rockettes, which is awesome, and come see What's Right with Nick Wright. They even brought signs like we're the Today Show. It's This one says, never a doubt. <laughs> this one says, 25,172 snaps, which was the number of snaps Andy Reid had coached on offense without having a Fugazi offensive offsides called that could change the entire playoff picture. And this one says, what's right is greater than the morning show, which is referring to the, you know, the morning national morning television shows where people stand outside. So, and we never have done this before ever. We have something of a live studio audience today inside Trentage. I, and, uh, and so they're here hanging out. Danny and Rachel seem thrilled. I would imagine for it, I don't know, but if I were at one or more of the daughters, they, they're probably like, what are we doing here right now? What's going on? <laughs> but they're hanging out. So we've got a live audience in Trentage. DeMonte looks great. Oh, and one other thing. Thursday, our 200th show, we might have a different special guest in studio for our 200th show. Demonte not being bumped, but I'm working on something to commemorate what is an important show. So, Demonte, we got a ton going on. You really, I got to tell you, you look fantastic, pal. Maybe it's the way it just uh, compared to your background, the colors or whatever it is. We don't have like a What's Right show uniform, but it is something along those lines you could wear every time. It's, you look great. I, think it's I just love haircut. it. How are you? It's the haircut. I appreciate it. I'm doing pretty good. Ready to talk about uh, some super I didn't notice stuff the haircut. going on in the NFL. Yep. Yep. Let's get right to it. Here's what missed the cut. DeMonte's team missed the fantasy football playoffs. I hope he at least set his roster every week. The Pistons lose their 20th straight game. And Tommy DeVito leads a comeback win over Green Bay. Kevin Clark had one of the funniest tweets I've ever seen. 
Kevin, when he was, Kevin Clark tweeted last night. In fact, I'm going to read you the tweet exactly because uh, I, I don't want to misquote him. And it's so, it's just so well done. Kevin Clark, who's a great writer and po- podcaster and all of that, he wrote last night every other sport is absolutely desperate to generate stars. And the NFL is like, the Giants have an Italian guy, and it's a national story. I love this sport. I love this country. <laughs> that really is the entirety of the Tommy DeVito story. It's like, hey, it's an Italian kid from Jersey. Isn't that awesome? Meanwhile, uh, Shohei Otani got $700 million. Not in the show. <laughs> Didn't make the show. All right. Let's get right to it. We are not well, leading with the Chiefs. Down, we will right. get... To th- the, yeah, it's very interesting the way he's it taken the money. We're not leading with the Chiefs. We'll get to the Chiefs in a moment. But there was, I think, a very noteworthy event in the NFL last night. So we're going to try to be timely and topical and get right to it. Then we'll do the Chiefs after. Also, I don't know why it says Chiefs collapse on the side of the screen that you guys will see in a moment. I don't know if I'd call that a collapse. But go ahead, DeMonte. Let's do Monday Night Football. Yeah, so last night, uh, Tua basically crumbled uh, against the Tennessee Titans. He didn't have Tariq Hill, yep. and you always say how there's similarities with him and uh, Brock Purdy. Uh, do you think this yep. is going to shine some light on the situation, how you say Purdy can't shine without the Avengers, and the moment the Tua loses Tariq Hill, he can't perform and, and take out the dub? Yeah, I mean, so Wilds tweeted, Tua can make an MVP leap right here, and I, and I responded, the Dolphins' actual MVP wasn't out there or right the whole game, and all of a sudden the operation grinds to a halt. Very similar to a situation out west when the team's actual MVP caliber players aren't out there. Some of this stuff is so easy to see when you actually look. So here's the deal. Two is good. Two is a good player. Better than I thought. Like, I've gone back and forth on Tua. When he was coming out of college, I said I thought he should be the number one pick. Then I thought he was going to be a career backup. And now I think he's good. And Brock Purdy is better than I thought he was. Brock Purdy obviously is good. He's, he's good. The, the problem is this, and this is where I'm not sure why there is such a disconnect in the commentary surrounding some of these guys. And Tua and Purdy, not just because they're both in the Shanahan system, not just because they both have superstar skill position guys, uh, but it certainly is part of it. They have gotten caught up in the vortex of this. Last year it was Tua a lot of it, and this year it's Purdy. And it's where folks that are failing to recognize that there are buckets of NFL quarterbacks. There are guys that are just bad and will never be good there are no circumstances under which they will be able to get out of their own way for long stretches of time and i we know who they are we have seen them no matter where they were drafted mitch trubisky was that marcus mariota was that uh i believe is sam darnold was that i i think zach wilson is that guys that no matter the circumstances they might show a flash they might show a game they might even show a month but they are not going to be able to be the guy. That's a, that's one bucket. Another bucket are guys that are good. And if they are in a bad situation, will look horrible. If they are in a fine situation, will look fine. And if they are in a great situation, will look great. This is... We have seen these guys throughout NFL history. It's the vast majority of NFL quarterbacks. The vast majority. It is not only Tua, not only Purdy, it's Jared Goff, who we have seen it throughout his career. You know what I mean? Like, oh, wait, Goff's awesome. He's taking the team to the Super Bowl. Oh, wait, Goff has tiny hands and can't hold on to the football, and and he's getting, you have to trade a first-round pick to get rid of him. Oh, wait, Goff's awesome again. He's with the Lions, and the offensive line's great. Oh, wait, Goff stinks again. The offensive line's breaking down. We we have, like, though he, Jared Goff is not changing. It, it, he is the same guy, and the circumstances around him have changed. Uh, I would argue Carson Wentz was this. Carson Wentz. Oh, Carson Wentz is fantastic. 
He had the he had a he still had his athleticism pre injury was in Philly in a good spot and then all of a sudden he's it's not quite as good of a spot and he looks terrible oh could he be good again no it it the and I'm trying to think of um, older examples of these guys I I deep down if you want to know the truth think the kind of best example version of this is Eli Manning. Like, Eli, Man- oh, Eli Manning's no good. And, but then, all of a sudden, Eli Manning would look great for a playoff run. Eli is maybe not a perfect example because he was more about a couple playoff runs. I'll give you the absolute best in scenario of the, and this old people will get mad, and I, I'm not trying to be, and, you know, this guy's now a colleague of sorts, so maybe he'll get mad, but I, it's just what I truly believe. Kurt Warner is the apex example of this. I mean, this guy is playing in a minor league. Oh, my God, this guy's the quarterback for the highest scoring offense ever. Oh, my God, this guy's the NFL's MVP. Oh, my God, this guy is benched for Mark Bolger. This guy can't get on the field in New York. This guy is going to be out of the league. Oh, my God, this guy's amazing again in Arizona. Again, I don't believe... He is going through all these transformations. His situation is. The the most obvious example is Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo. Oh, my God. Jimmy Garoppolo leads the league in passer rating, leads the league in EPA. Jimmy Garoppolo is benched for Aiden O'Connell. What changed? The circumstances and the system. Okay? I think Geno is one of these guys. He was in a terrible circumstance early in his career. He looked so bad, he's he can't he can't get a shot for 6 years. Comes to Seattle circumstance a little better, infrastructure's better. Oh, Gino. Look at how much better he got. You think he got that much better 6 years riding the bench or do the circumstances change? Which then brings us to the only bucket of quarterbacks that in my opinion should be in MVP discussions. The difference makers, the guys that no matter how bad the circumstances are, elevate you to a certain level, and if the circumstances are good, you are a legitimate A contender, and if the circumstances are great, you're breaking records, and everyone is searching for those guys. And that's why last night, And this is where people will lose their mind. And I'm not trying to have a Purdy discussion here. If you were to ask me, Nick Wright, hey, you're running the 33rd NFL team. And of the quarterbacks who were playing in that game last night, you can have one of them moving forward. I would roll the dice on Will Levis over Tua. And I don't know if Will Levis is actually even going to be good. But I know he has the physical characteristics and the upside that he has the possibility to be one of those difference makers. It's the reason that before this year's draft, I said, now I didn't see the C.J. Stroud thing coming, but everyone was all in on Bryce Young, and I said, if you're going to take quarterback, take Anthony Richardson. Take the six foot five, crazy athletic, amazing arm talent freak that maybe can be a star. Because I know Bryce can't. It's too little. And everyone was like, oh, that's an unfair comment. You're not going to go deeper than that? I'm like, no. Much like riding a roller coaster, there are certain things where if you don't reach the minimum height threshold, you're ineligible. And one of them is franchise quarterback. Kyler is trying to break that, but Kyler is also a crazy athlete. And he still might be too little, but Kyler at least is super strong, would have been a pro baseball player, crazy athlete. And so there are, the, the we can go up and down the list. We have seen these quarterbacks our whole lives. Derek Carr is one of these guys that I, I believe the very good version. Matt Ryan was one of these guys. They're good. They're good. And if their circumstances are great, they will look great. They will be, they're a chameleon to their circumstances. And that is who Tua is. And so Tua, they can score 70 points in a game, and they can have a game like last night where 
I know they ended up scoring 27, but if you watched the game, you or 28, you understand that that was not real. Or it was 27, right? You understand that that wasn't real. They had a defensive score, and then they got the they they blocked a punt or a muffed punt inside the 10, and then another turnover inside the 20. The offense ground to a halt, and where my real frustration around some of the Purdy discourse. And it would be happening, I promise, if there was a ton of Tua MVP discourse, is it's not that I'm trying to tear any of these guys down. It's that I think we should be uplifting the actual great players. And the Niners have a bunch of undeniably great players. And when, and, and when these guys are even interviewed by the media after a great game, you know what they're asked about? The god dog quarterback. And it's all of these apex predator players explaining why, oh no, you don't get it. Our quarterback's better than you think. Rather than the questions being, hey, Trent Williams, you're making a case you're the greatest left tackle in 20 years. Hey, Christian McCaffrey. You have 17 touchdowns, and you're leading the rushing race by 300 yards. And so it, it is frustrating to me. And I thought Monday Night Football was a good uh, uh, kind of microcosm of it. All right, speaking of with, frustrating things, let's talk. Yeah. Go ahead, Demonse. No, I was about to say, with all that said, uh, Miami got the well, the, Miami lost, Titans won. And mm-hmm. you tweeted out. I don't know, like the you tweeted out this road that the Chiefs would have to take to get to the playoffs. Yeah. It's the one seed, my bad. It's and it's like yeah, it's I probably simple. got better chances of hitting a t- ten leg teaser. But what's this all about? And how likely? Okay, well let's talk about it. Let's talk happens. about it real quick. Hold on. Oh, okay, so you think it's unlikely? Let's talk about it. Let's go. Just go through row by row before we get to the actual Chiefs topic. It it is all predicated on the Chiefs winning out. Okay. Their games are against the Patriots. I'm going to let you, Demonze. You call it win-loss for the Chiefs, okay? Patriots. Chiefs-Patriots. Who you got? All right, Patriots. Chiefs. There you go. Okay, Chiefs-Raiders. Who you got? Chiefs. Okay, Chiefs-Bengals. Jake Brown explained quarterback. Jake's playing well. At Arrowhead, uh, New Year's Eve. Who you got? That one, that's that's gonna be a game. Uh, okay, that's, call that's it a coin flip. Game. Okay, yeah. that's fine. And Chiefs Chargers, the final week of the regular season, looks like Justin Herbert's potentially out for the year, and we're dealing with Easton Stick. I'm just curious I'll who give, you got. I'll give the Probably Chiefs get... the up there, but that could also be a game. Okay, okay. So you, all right, that's fine. So you, but you think the Chiefs going four and zero is not only on the board, it's, not it's super a unlike. very real right. possibility. It's not super unlikely. It's very possible. Okay. All right. Miami needs to lose one more time. Miami plays the Jets, Dallas, Baltimore, and Buffalo. Do you think they're going 4-0? I don't. It's going to be harder to go 4-0 than the Chiefs. That's for sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, check, check. And now the hard part. Baltimore needs to lose 2 of 4. Baltimore plays Jacksonville, San Francisco, Miami, and then a Steelers team that owns them, that owns Lamar historically. I I am not saying it is the Vegas favorite right now. What I'm saying is Miami's, lo- Miami's loss last night was so important because there it was going to be hard to find two losses for Buffalo, I'm sorry, for Baltimore and Miami when for each of them, one of their harder games is against each other. So yes, one of them will lose, but one of them will win. With Miami's loss last night, all you need is Miami to lose to Dallas, which they will, and then and then Baltimore to lose two of their four. Jacksonville, the Prince, getting a little healthier, coming off a bad performance. The Niners, who everyone's given the Super Bowl to. A Miami team that game's going to mean a ton to. And then the Steelers. It's on the board. All I'm saying is, it is on the board. Now let's get to the Chiefs and the game from Sunday afternoon. Yeah, so obviously there was a big uh, offsides call in the Chiefs game. Um, yeah. Kelsey lateraled it to Tony, and it all got called back. Mm-hmm. And um, yep. Mahomes went in his presser to then blame the refs and kind of just said that they shouldn't yep. call stuff and to let the game be played. Um, yeah. The receivers have obviously been a problem for the Chiefs all year. Is this officially yep. out of hand? Is this something that they can come back from? 
Okay, so the, a lot here. One is people are like, you know, Mahomes needs to be holding his receivers accountable. I don't know what he's doing in practice or in the meetings. I would assume he is holding, uh, attempting to hold them accountable there. I don't think it would be good for him to air out his receivers on the sideline or in the press conference. Now, you can disagree with me on that. I'm telling you I prefer you not to do that publicly. I don't think that is what good leaders do, is publicly air out their teammates who everyone knows are struggling. Again, some people would say that is what they need. Now, a lot of people believe Eric Bieniemy was the bad cop guy for the Chiefs offense. He's gone, and now you don't have anyone holding these guys accountable. It is very hard for me to believe that Kelsey, in particular, is not getting after these guys behind closed doors. But that's not really the story. The story is the call and Mahomes' reaction to the call. So the reason our friends from Little Rock brought in this sign that says 25,172 snaps is because that's how many offensive snaps Andy Reid has coached, and that plays that penalty's never been called. So folks are like, oh, so you don't want them to call it. What Andy was saying after the game, when he's like, you usually get a warning on that, is if a guy is lined up at the ball or in front of the ball, typically the referee will tell the coach or the player, hey, tell him or it's going to be a flag. And the reason I know that is not only because Andy Reid you know, explained it, but also the pure math of, do we think Andy's gone his entire career? Patrick's gone his entire career and no one's ever lined up in front of the ball? Of course not. It happens. They get warnings and they move back. You can say that's a ridiculous system. I don't necessarily disagree with you, but if that's the system, that's the system. I would almost compare it to the way delay of game is called in the league. We all watch the NFL every week. We see the play clock go to zero. We see there being another beat, then the ball is snapped. And that is not a delay of game. By the letter of the law, maybe it should be. The referees have decided that's not how we're going to call it. So whatever our rules of engagement established are, we should play with those throughout the course of a football game. Credit, by the way, then, and this is where the real frustration comes in, for many of us, to Dan Orlovsky for breaking down the tape. Kadarius Tony was lined up in that exact alignment five times in that football game prior to the play with a minute left. So the frustration is if it first of all, if you don't want to give any warnings and you just want to flag it, then flag it. And if that were flagged in the first quarter and he just keeps doing it, obviously that's on him. And this is on Kadarius Tony. But if I am lined up in the same spot the entire game and the ref never says anything to me and never flags me, I am going to understandably think I'm fine. And last night, and credit to Dane and Hughes for pointing this out, last night, Jalen Waddell, lined up in the exact place Kadarius Tony was. It's not flagged. There is a reason that in the 2021 season, offensive offsides was called once the entire season. In the 2022 season, offensive offsides was called twice in the entire season. Now, after the game, the NBC's ref was like, ah, it's a point of emphasis this year. It's been called 11 times. Nonsense, because I dug into the data. Going into last night's game, of or the Sunday's game, it had been called 11 times. Nine of those were on offensive linemen on tush-push plays. So it's not a point of emphasis. It's happening more this year because there's this new bastardized quarterback sneak that guys are trying to do like the Eagles. They can't do like the Eagles, and they have the guard in front of the center. And that is a different spot than what we're talking about here. Because in that spot, you would get a real advantage from offensive offsides. Because you're fighting for a few inches. So that is the context of Mahomes losing his mind. Now Mahomes went on Carrington Harrison, my former intern, and now the afternoon host at 16 in Kansas City's radio show, and apologized for losing his mind. That's fine. I don't think he need to. 
I needed to. I'm old enough to remember Tom Brady on Monday Night Football not getting a flag. He threw a Hail Mary. They threw a flag on a Hail Mary and then picked it up. And Brady chased the referees into the tunnel, berating them. Yelled at the refs, running into the tunnel, berating them. I think you're allowed to lose your cool every once in a while. And here's the Wilds on TV yesterday said the Chiefs' d defense is like someone who got caught robbing a store and all of their defense is everything other than saying, I didn't rob the store. Like, ah, it was no big deal I robbed the store. Nobody cares that I robbed the store. And that is not how I look at it. Because everyone's like, oh, he clearly admitted he did it. I'm going to use a different legal analogy. I am, I, I drive on this street every, because the, con, let me get, add a little more context here. The other context of Mahomes losing his mind is last week, and you guys heard on this show, I couldn't do the show, I apologize because you heard me on the TV show, I did not blame the refs, Mahomes did not blame the refs, Nobody blamed the refs with the Chiefs after the blatant pass interference penalty that we all saw was uncalled, right? So if you're Patrick Mahomes, to use the legal analogy, here's what happened. A week ago, your car got stolen right in front of a cop. He saw it. It's like, ah, nothing I can do about that. Sorry. And in fact, you lost your job because of it. Because you couldn't get to work anymore. A week later, you're driving down this street in your new car going 36 and a 35. You see the cop, he doesn't do anything. You see the cop the next day, he doesn't do anything. See the cop the next day, doesn't do anything. It's now your fifth day on the job, the new job you needed because your car got stolen, you lost your previous job, and this cop didn't do anything about it. Driving 36 and a 35, and you're on your way to your most important meeting of the year. And he pulls you over. You're like, what did I do? It's like, well, you were speeding. 36 and a 35. You're like, excuse me? He's like, I show you the radar detector. Are you going to argue you weren't speeding? It's like, no, man. But I've done this all week, and you haven't stopped me. It's like, the rules are the rules. We're here to enforce the law. Aren't you the guy that saw my car stolen a week ago and no, and you didn't do anything? Eh, you see let's not worry about that. Though. You might lose your temper. There's a, there's a you might lose like your this, temper. It has a number on there. Yep. Correct. You are oh, right. Well. And that is, and that's the argument is, well, then don't speed. That's fine. Now, with all that said, I, the Chiefs need to be better. It's not why they lost. It wasn't a it was and I'm gonna make one last point and then we can move on because I know we're going long here as we always do and we have a massive show today. And this is the point I made on television that Wilds and Brew instantly rolled their eyes at, but I believe it. I don't think the officials have been good enough this year to have earned the right to make that type of nuanced call. I think <laughs> that if you if Every week, there are massive, egregious officiating errors on the most obvious things. Then you have less wiggle room, in my opinion, on guys. We I know it's a it's seemingly a you know a matter of three inches forward or backwards, but we're pitching a perfect game out here, and I'm not going to miss a call. This same refereeing crew, Mahomes threw the ball eight yards forward and they <laughs> called it a fumble, let the other team return it, and then you heard Mahomes, the ref say on the mic to Mahomes, oh, I couldn't see it. But, but, but yeah, you couldn't see it. But you sure as hell could see with your damn protractor where Kadarius Tony was when you couldn't the five previous plays. Give me a break. Give me a break. All right, let's do Cowboys-Eagles, Demonze. Oh, the Cowboys had an impressive blowout against the Eagles. Who are the Eagles, man? A few weeks ago, you said the Dak was in the lead for uh, MVP race. And now he's mm -hmm. currently sitting at the top in the running. Uh, how classic confident are two, you? Classic two, Demonte. A right, classic category two take <laughs> by me. Uh, listen, Dak's got to be the MVP. 
I don't want to have the Purdy argument right now. Uh, their their stats are nearly identical. Their team record is identical. Their team points per game, the Cowboys are ahead. Uh, on the stats level, Purdy's up 1% in completion percentage, 7 yards per game, and 9 points in passer rating. Dak is up in team points per game, touchdown-interception ratio. What about the head-to-head, And head, people will be like, no, it, it, listen, Purdy played way better in that game. There's no doubt about that. Now, but the strength of schedule thing is misleading. Because the Cowboys have played a far easier schedule than the Niners. They have not actually played easier defenses. So going into this week's game, the Cowboys have played the 18th toughest defensive schedule. The Niners have played the 19th toughest defensive schedule. So if all of those things are a wash, then it does come into, okay, whose supporting cast is, you know, helping more. And it's obviously Brock. So I don't want the Dak should be the MVP. I, I had to, my MVP kind of list going into last night was Dak a clear one, Tyreek a clear two, and Lamar lurking as if he runs, you know what I mean? He plays like he did this past Sunday the rest of the year. He could come steal it. It's That's the, where I land on it. Go ahead. When you say supporting cast, are you saying like just on offense or like the whole team? You're just yes. saying just offense, right? Okay. All right, come I uh, just on offense, sure. but it should be noted the Niners have the number one scoring defense in the league. Now I think the Cowboys one defense scoring, is right. Does that also mean so the Niners one defense, defense as well? Well, it, I mean, some guess. people do it by yards, some people do it by points. So the Niners, I'll, I'll give it to you right now. So like as far as yards allowed per game, the Niners defense is wait. Oh, that's oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. The Niners' defense in yards allowed per game is seventh, and the Cowboys is third. In points allowed per game, the Niners are first, and the Cowboys are fourth. So the Niners' defense allows the only team in the league to allow less than 16 points per game. The Cowboys' defense allows just under 18 points per game. So yeah, I, I think the point you were going to make is that the Cowboys' defense might be better, and it might, right. certainly has more, I don't want to say more stars. Niners' defense got a bunch of stars too, but you, the Cowboys' defense is playing out of its mind. But as far you, the Niners aren't, don't have a, let's just, again, call the defense as a wash then. You know what I mean? The Cowboys allow fewer yards. The Niners allow fewer points. They're both two of the great best defenses in football. The, and the Cowboys' offensive weapons are really good. But the Niners have the best offensive weapons in football, and I don't think anyone would disagree with that. All right, last one. LeBron's fifth ring. Let's do Yo, it. Yo, so the Lakers won the inaugural in-season tournament over the, Pace, or the Pacers this weekend. Um, everybody's, uh, I don't, was going to say the wrong term, but everybody's talking about what LeBron right. did and his dominance instead of late Anthony Davis, 40, 41 and 20. I think he had four blocks as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it's yeah. only a matter of time before they name this trophy after LeBron James. I don't think they're going to name this trophy after him. I think that they're the, the, I think that LeBron will have one of these things named after him. I don't think it's going to be the in-season tournament trophy. And as far as AD, I just think people need to understand for the MVP of it, AD was far and away the best guy in the final. But the tournament MVP, it was not even based just on the three uh, knockout round games. It was based on how you did over the entirety of the in-season tournament. So all seven games. And in that metric, it's not even an argument who the MVP was. It was LeBron. Even if it was just based on the three knockout round games, it probably was LeBron. But AD was sensational. Sensational in the final. Uh, and listen, that's the Lakers' path. I mean, they hit two threes in that game, and they were blowing out the Pacers. And AD's got to be great, and they've got to dominate with their size. And Cam Reddish's ability to... Guard the point of attack and guard Halliburton was shocking. And he was the first guy to slow Halliburton down in a month. Um, all right, go ahead and ask your follow-up you know, before we move on. So uh, it's fun time and everything, not trying to take anything away from the moment. But yeah. what do you think about uh, the Lakers celebrating as if they won uh, the, the NBA Finals? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I a banner th as well. Do you think they should? Well, that? I think the NBA asked them to hang a banner to commemorate it. I actually think the way they're doing the banner, Demonze, is cool. 
And it's not going to look like their championship banner. It's going to be a different Damn. look, shape, and feel. But what it, it's going to be like high school banners where it says like district championship and then every year you've won it, you don't add a new banner. You just add another year to it. You know what okay. I mean? Like you've been played in high school. And I think that's actually a, a cool little wrinkle because whenever you go into a high school gym – and you look at it, you're like, oh, man, the senior class of 97, you know what I mean, won right. three district titles over the course of their time. I think that'll be – this is one of those things you got to kind of look forward 20 years to. But it would be cool to go into an NBA arena, look up. You obviously know if a team's won a title or not. But you might be like, oh, damn, who was on this team 15 years ago? They won three out of four in-season tournaments. Like, I, I think it'll be a little something. I do think that uh, – so, and them celebrating, who cares? You, if you hold the tournament in Vegas and you give cash as the, as the prize, there's going to be a celebration. I mean, the NBA didn't want them to not celebrate. And so I got no problem with it, and I think it's cool. All right, my one of my favorite Demonze stories ever. Next, plus we re we update plant your flag. That's next. What's right?
and watch right with Nick Wright episode 199. Holidays are upon us, and I know I'm excited, and everyone will start thinking of what gifts to buy their significant others. I know I have, and I want to tell you about a great holiday gift idea, Lightbox. Lightbox Lab Grown Diamonds are proudly grown from 100% renewable wind energy at the Lightbox Lab in Portland, Oregon. Not only that, but they are simply priced. Lightbox is Lab Grown Diamond jewelry ranges from classic studs that you can see on Demonze every podcast and I got to see it in person when I was in Los Angeles last week and they look outstanding also more of the moment tennis bracelets drop earrings and more I know my wife would like any of those and like I said Demonze loves the earrings that Lightbox was kind enough to send him Lightbox lab grown diamonds are perfect for family friends or even yourself make it easy for yourself and get everyone something special with a discount we have for you Shop now at lightboxjewelry.com. Use promo Nick Wright for 10% off site wide. All right. So uh, before we get to uh, plant your flag and Demo- put Demonze on the screen because I forgot this happened. And this was such. I, I was. I knew exactly how Demonze was feeling and how wildly. Not embarrassed, but bad he felt and didn't know what to do, and he had done nothing wrong. So, Demonze and I are at Lil Wayne's house for the Chiefs-Packers game, but we get there right when uh, Niners-Eagles starts. And I'm obviously not going to say where uh, he lives, but there's a bunch of different hills in the Los Angeles area, and most of them, what they have in common is really bad phone service. And so we're we're there, and all right, you now know what I'm what I'm talking about. Yeah. So we're there, and I didn't, and I and after, shortly after I got there, I was like, oh, our phones aren't working, and I all and I swear to Monse, I thought, and I was like, oh, I should ask for the Wi-Fi, so Demonze doesn't have to because. I knew we were going to be there all day, and I knew you had people you had to talk to. You might have some work things going on, track bets, whatever it was. You were At some point, you were going to need connectivity. And right when I was going to ask, I got something happened. I got distracted, something, and then I forgot about it. Wasn't worried about it. Um, so like an hour later, Demonze says like very quietly to uh, someone, because it's Wayne and a bunch of his buddies. He's like, hey. Uh, can I get on the Wi-Fi here? And one of the guys is like, yeah, no problem. Uh, this is all you got to do. And tells him the, there's like five networks. Tells him the one it is. That like, he's like, oh, I'll be able to share it from my phone. And I'm watching this happen. And I'm thinking, I'm like, there's no chance you'll be able to share it from your phone because you don't have Demonte's number in your phone. But I don't want to like jump, you know what I mean? Like jump in. And then all of a sudden, because he is just such a kind guy, Wayne hops up off the couch and starts, like, looking through drawers. And Demonze realizes he's looking for the Wi-Fi password. And Demonze immediately is like, no, 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 it's no big deal. Like, you don't don't have to worry about it. He's like, no, it's around here somewhere. And it became like, I don't know, like a five-minute thing yeah. of them like s- searching for like the sh- the laminated sheet that has the Wi-Fi password. Someone was trying to share it from a phone, and I could just feel Demonze sinking into the couch. Like, oh my God, you invited me to your house. He- you're now up looking through drawers, looking for this thing, and you and I didn't talk about it. But it was such a just watching it. At some point, I was like, ah, let me try to help, and then I was like, you know what? Nobody's actually. <laughs> The only person thinking about this so hard is Demonze. Wayne didn't care. His friends didn't care. They were super helpful. But in the moment, I'm like, Demonze wants to turn into a bird so he can fly far, far away from where we are right now. <laughs> Did I read that yeah. situation properly? Um, you definitely, you definitely read it correctly. I think initially, though, it was little Wayne that I had asked, and like it was just, it did turn into a whole thing. I didn't expect the <laughs> it to take so long to. <laughs> And I just, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like it at all. Uh, I just also didn't I want to seem like didn't. one of those kids that just can't be there without Wi-Fi. But uh, no, I, but, yeah, I know the whole thing. I was like, oh my god, he Demonte right now is so uncomfortable. I was like, yeah. the whole, and I just, I was experiencing it on your behalf. 
Um, the whole thing, it was there. I mean, there were a few other funny moments, including it was the the Eminem Wayne, thing is what I thought all you of, were gonna say. <laughs> oh no <laughs> no no no! I was no that. Uh, no, Demonze mentioned uh, a few like a few artists, and then one of them he was worried that like Wayne had a beef with or something, and that he had offended him. I was like, no, you're fine. That's not what I was gonna mention. <laughs> what I was gonna mention is like halfway through the game, all of a sudden Wayne came like out of some closet with like these plastic wrapped brand new couch <laughs> cushions that are like <laughs> supplemental cushions. And he's and he set one next to like all of us, and he's like, "Yeah, this couch is too low, so I, you know what I mean. So you might want to sit on these." And I, it was super nice, and it was not a bad idea. But I also would never have actually like done it or requested it. But he had brought it over and set it next to me, and so at some point I'm like, "Yeah, yeah. might as well unwrap <laughs> this thing from the plastic and sit on this some bitch." All right, Demonze, let's plant your flag. Let's do it. All right, so we're off last Tuesday, so we weren't able to do it. Uh, but it's a new month, mm -hmm. and it's time to plant your new flags and take uh, a flag mm -hmm. of your choosing away. A uh, reminder, you've yep. got a mountain that takes – oh, no, never mind, not a reminder. So first yeah. one you got. You got Chiefs, it. Chiefs the best team in the NFL. Uh, the second one yep. you got Salas on the hot seat, lose his job. Third, you got QB yep. woes will, be, uh, will bite the 49ers. And for four, yep. you got Belichick's job security will be a hot debate topic. Which one of these do you want to get right, rid of? All right, so the Robert Sala on the hot seat topic was from September. Oh. I'm keeping it. The The Chiefs, the best team in the NFL topic, or opinion, was from September. I know right now it's not looking like that. They're going to win the Super Bowl, so I'm keeping it. QB woes will bite the 49ers. That was from September. Right now, some people think their MVP of the league is their quarterback. I'm not changing it. It's why they're going to lose in the playoffs. Belichick, hot debate topic, meaning his job security. That was from October. I'm not changing it. The Lions will be the one seed. That's the newest one, and that one's done. That one is out of there. And I am going to replace it with, while everyone right now thinks the Bills are going to surge into the postseason, I am here to tell you that it will not be the Bills stealing the seventh seed in the AFC. It will be the Bengals with Jake Browning. The Bengals who are now at 7-6 and six with games Pittsburgh, I'm sorry, Minnesota, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Cleveland left, the Cincinnati Bengals, I believe, are going to go 10-7, and seven, only lose to Kansas City, and they will be the um, seven seed in the AFC. So I'm calling, it will not be Buffalo, it will be Cincinnati, and it should be noted if Buffalo and Cincinnati both finish 10-7, and seven, Cincinnati gets the spot because they beat Buffalo head-to-head. -head. All right, DeMonte, let's go to the game. We are playing freak out or chill out today. First, you got the, the Jags. Prince is definitely tough, but he clearly is not as elite as Joe Flacco. The Jags have lost okay. two straight to backup quarterbacks and only have one a one-game lead over the Texans and the Colts. Should the Jaguars freak out or chill out? Jaguars should uh, chill out. The Cincinnati loss, the defense melted down. That was unfortunate. And the Cleveland loss, the defense was really bad again. Now, the Cleveland loss, Trevor shouldn't have been playing. He was injured. Still threw for three touchdowns, but had three picks, two of which were really bad picks. There's no denying it. And they obviously are in a rough spot hosting Baltimore this week. But then at the end of the year, it's Tampa, Carolina, Tennessee. And as far as their ability to win the division, the critical note is this. They swept Indianapolis and they split with Houston. Houston is one and two in the division. Jacksonville is four and one. So it would end. Uh, Indianapolis is three and two and they swept them. So. If they finish with the same record as any of those teams, they will win the division by strength of tiebreakers. So because of that, they shouldn't freak out about winning the division. But the defense has been so bad lately that with Trevor banged up, they should freak out a bit about their ability to go on a real playoff run. All right, next. All right, uh, the Lions have looked like a disaster in recent weeks. They pull wins out of the jaws of defeat a few times, but have got 
Golf can't get his con- uh, turnovers under control. They're going to be embarrassed in the playoffs. Do you think the Lions should freak out or chill out? Oh, I think they unfortunately should freak out. I mean, they're fortunate to not be on a three-game losing streak. They're fortunate to have beaten New Orleans. Now, I don't think that they have a you know a brutal remaining schedule. Denver, Minnesota, Dallas, Minnesota. They should be able to go at least two and two down the stretch, probably three and one. And no matter what, they'll be hosting a playoff game for the first time in forever. They'll be you know in the playoffs for the first time in forever. I understand all of that, but their ability to win a playoff game, it it's well. Let me rephrase it. I think they can win a home playoff game. In fact, I think they will win a home playoff game. They'll be the three seed, which means they will be playing in the postseason the six seed in the NFC, which is right now the Vikings. It could be the Packers. It could be the Rams. It could be the Seahawks. Like the, They're going to go to the playoffs and win their first home playoff game, but then they are going to get rocked in round two. Uh, whether it's by San Francisco, Dallas, Philly. Well, Philly's an interesting one. They might be able to do so- the Philly's defense, and we didn't talk about this before. I, I was supposed to. I ended up just talking about Dak and the MVP stuff. Philly has a bottom five defense across the board. So right now, like, Phil- Philly's defense is hugely problematic for them, but the Lions as a real contender is probably dead in the water, and the Lions as a... Uh, as a team that could go on the road and win a playoff game, I was always a little skeptical of. That's why I thought they had to have the one seed. And now, I mean, they're dead for the one seed. They're not going to get that. They're almost assuredly going to be the three seed. All right, next. Uh, Yeah, so my guy Lamar and the Ravens, they're inching clo- closer to that number one spot in the AFC and had the best play all weekend that didn't get called back. Uh, they're starting to have a team of destiny. Yeah, and it, and by the way, unlike the Chiefs touchdown, that one probably should have been called back. A couple blatant blocks in the back, but let's not worry about the officiating in the NFL. Go ahead, sorry. Go yeah, ahead, as you be were. Perfect, you know. So the rest, so the rest of the AFC freak out or chill out. Oh, I listen. It's I wouldn't freak. I mean, it's Chiefs. I just say be aware. It's Chiefs. Yeah, it's Chiefs Ravens. And here's the 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 Dolphins are not, in my feeling, a legit contender. The Jags are playing their worst ball right now, and all you know the other AFC potential wild card teams or playoff teams, like look at their quarterback situation. Cleveland has Joe Flacco. Pittsburgh right now is Mitch Trubisky slash slash Kenny Pickett. The Colts have uh, Gardner Minshew. The Broncos have Russell Wilson. The Bengals have Jake Browning. The Bills, obviously, Josh Allen's, you know, playing really well. He didn't play that great this weekend, but he's been pretty good aside from the turnovers this season. But I don't think they're going to make it. The Texans are scary. The Texans are scary for a game, but they're not going to be going on a deep playoff run, and the injuries starting to pile up for them. Here's what I will say about Baltimore. This is their moment, Demonze. If Baltimore does not win the AFC this year, with the Bills faltering, with Joe Burrow done for the season, with the Browns on their fourth quarterback of the year, with Trevor banged up, if they with the if they don't win it this year, then why would people think it'll change moving forward? So it is the Ravens are legit, but they are also oddly under maybe the most pressure of any of these AFC teams because the only real AFC contender that's whole is the Chiefs, and the Chiefs are in the midst of their worst stretch of football since Mahomes got there. All right, last one. Uh, the Bengals have won two straight without Burrow, thanks to Jake Browning. Nobody ever talks about Zach, T- Zach Taylor as a top head coach, so maybe that means that Burrow wasn't that good all along. Should Burrow truthers freak out or chill out? They're not. Listen, the term truthers should be saved for people that believe ludicrous things. Believing Joe Burrow is excellent is not ludicrous. With that said, I I jokingly said on the on the morning meeting for the TV show that I'm two more excellent Jake Browning games away from entertaining the idea that Joe Burrow is a system quarterback. But I'm joking when I say that. Listen, it is maybe Jake Browning's good. 
He wasn't that good in college. I don't understand how it's happening, but Jake's played well. Now, part of it is the defenses he's faced the last two weeks, but you got to give the guy credit. Jake's played really, really well in these two starts, but Joe Burrow's obviously one of the very best quarterbacks in football, and I, the, we have not only his collegiate career, but every step of his NFL career to show you that. And what Now, Burrow's one of the only great quarterbacks that does not wow you with physical tools. It's not his arm strength, it's not his size, but it is, if, for him, yes, he's very accurate, but more than that, it's his temperament. And it is the how unwaveringly confident and clutch he is that makes takes a guy who has like a B-level archetype from a physical trait standpoint and turns him into an A quarterback. All right, stories from the Bahamas Poker Tournament Plus. We answer your chat questions next. What's right? Welcome back. What's right with Nick Wright episode 199. And as you guys know, I love and use Airbnb all the time, whether for a work trip or for a vacation, I'm always looking for the best places to stay. Maybe you yourself have stayed in Airbnb before and thought, Hey, seems pretty doable. Maybe my place could be an Airbnb. It could be as simple as starting with a spare room or your whole place. When you're away, either way, you could be sitting on an Airbnb and not even know it. Maybe you're traveling to see friends and family for the holidays while you're away. Your home could be an Airbnb, whether you could use extra money to cover some bills or for something a little more fun, your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Um, all right, so I went down to the World Series of Poker Paradise uh, in Atlantis this weekend, and I did it for a few reasons. One was I want to be more involved in the poker world, and the people at the WSOP asked me you know, if I wanted to come down, and I was able to, for our soccer fans out there, I interviewed Sergio Aguero, uh, the greatest player I would argue in Man City history, a great Argentinian legend. I interviewed Tony Parker and Becky Hammond, who were both down there to play in the tournament. Becky Hammond, the coach of the Las Vegas Aces, and one day will be the first uh, female head coach uh, in NBA history, I believe. And Tony Parker, an all-time legend. Uh, I, I asked Tony Parker a LeBron question, and he made fun of me. He's like, I watch your show. I'm not going to do a French accent, but he's like, I watch your show. I knew you would ask me a LeBron question. Uh, and I also interviewed uh, the guy who I believe is the greatest poker player uh, currently alive in Jason Kuhn, who shout out to Jason Kuhn, by the way, he just in the Bahamas came in second in the hundred thousand dollar buy-in tournament for like 1.8 million, uh, alongside Phil Hellmuth. And we can play you a clip of that in a bit. But while I was there, I also played in the 50 K, the $50,000 buy-in, uh, against all these other legends. And I had a plan and I studied a ton and I knew exactly what I was going to do and I am here to tell you despite all of that the moment the cards went in the air when I say my heart was beating out of my chest when I say I was like almost physically shaking I'm not exaggerating at my table there were 70 people in this tournament at my table 
the person at the table who had the least in career poker tournament winnings other than me was at six million dollars. The guy directly to my left is was David Peters, who I'm gonna check it. I think he's fifth on the all time poker money list. Oh yeah. He's at forty four million dollars. Two players over from me was Seth Davies who was super nice and it seems like watches the show and chatted sports with me after the tournament. He's at $23 million. Uh, At the end of the table was Chris Brewer, who uh, is on one of the all-time heaters after being on one of the all-time cold deck unlucky streaks. Chris Brewer is a career earnings of over $20 million. So it was just a bunch of the best players in the world and me. And so my hope, you start with 300,000 in chips. The blinds are 1,000, 2,000. It's 40-minute levels. If you don't understand poker, this won't make sense to you. You can fast forward through this part of the podcast if you're listening. If you don't understand poker, it'll make a ton of sense. So you start with 150 big blinds, great structure, crazy deep. But my entire, once I, my, so I was super nervous. I didn't think I was going to be, but I was. Negranu and I registered together. Jason Kuhn is at what, like, the, it's just the best of the best and me. Orpin Kachikagalu is there. Everybody's there. Eric Seidel won the damn thing. Eric, the guy who won the thing. I think he's second on the all-time money list. I'm going to check real quick. The guy who won it, Eric Seidel, who you guys, if you're a poker fan, remember from forever. Yeah, he's at $45 million in career earnings. No, he's seventh on the all-time money list. So th- these are the people that I'm competing with, right? And so once I realized how nervous I was, I was like, okay. I'm just going to ease my way into this. I'm going to fold a bunch of hands early, even if they're borderline, till I get my bearings about me. Second hand of the tournament, I'm in the small blind. I get aces. I'm like, well, that's not a foldable hand, obviously. It's the best hand you can get. But I don't want to play a big pot with the big blind, who, like I said, is David Peters, fifth on the all-time money list. So I'm like, you know what? I don't care that I don't maximize value here. I'm gonna. I know I'm gonna be playing this wrong. I just want to. I just want to win a small pot and move on. So I have aces. Uh, it comes queen eight eight. He bets. I call. Comes a ten. He bets. I call. And it's two diamonds, two spades. And then it comes a queen. And he obviously has a queen, but I have way. You know, I've I have so underrepped my aces. I had, you know, I, it was a ro- it was probably the wrong call, but he has so many bluffs there. There are, I shouldn't say so many. He has some bluffs there and there's no chance he, th- he thinks there's any possibility. I have aces. So he bets not that big on the river. I call he, he has ace queen and I have aces and I, you know, I lose cause he had a two outer, but I also played it poorly. But what's crazy about poker is had I played that right, I'd have been eliminated from the tournament on hand two. And it would have been the most mortifying (laughs) moment of my life. Because had I played it right, here's how the action goes. Uh, I limp the small. I didn't know I was supposed to do that, but Jason Kuhn was kind enough to tell me afterwards, these guys are such wizards. I gave him the hand history. He's like, yeah, 96% of your range is a limp there. And if you're going to raise the small, you got to go super big. But he's like, if you played that right, he's like, it gets all in on the turn and you get two outed. He's like, the the way it should have gone is I limp the small blind. He raises out of the big blind. I three bet. He calls. Flop comes queen, eight, eight. He has ace, queen. He is feeling great. I bet he calls. Turn is a 10. I bet he raises. I jam. We're all in. He has ace, queen. If he calls, which at that point he probably has to, he's all in with ace, queen. I'm all in with aces. The only thing that can knock me out is a queen. He comes a queen, and I go home and say, you know, four minutes into a 50k tournament so I don't so I lose a portion of my stack but I actually got lucky because I played it wrong 20 minutes later I have king jack I flop a straight I actually played that hand I think perfectly I got an extra bet in on the turn because it went uh how did it go it went I bet uh Chris Brewer raised I three bet him he called so that was, I played that one well. So an hour into the tournament, I'm in the hijack. 
I have jacks. I've settled in. I'm not quite as nervous. I have about 225,000 in chips. The blinds are now 2,000, 3,000, super deep. And I get jacks. And I raise the jacks to 7,000. Chris Brewer again. He's in the big blind. He re-raises me to 27,000. And that there, do you four bet the jacks or do you smooth call? That is, you know, the the true pros are going to have what they call a balanced approach. Sometimes they four bet that hand. Sometimes they smooth call. Either one is fine. You just have to, you know, vary your approach. Uh, I just call. Flop comes jack, nine, seven, one diamond, one spade, one club. And I am the happiest guy in the world. I have flopped top set. The only hand that can beat me is 10-8. He three bet. So the odds of him having 10-8 are almost zero. He can have aces. He can have kings. He can have queens. He can have ace-king, ace-queen. He can have any pair lower than jacks. I could have gotten crazy lucky and he had sevens or nines and we went set over set and I'm going to double up. He also could have just pure three bet bluffs, in which case I'm crushing everything. So again, it was, I made it 7,000 pre, he made it 27. I called flop comes Jack nine, seven rainbow. I have two Jacks. He bets out for... I think I want to make sure I get it right. Like right, right around forty percent pot bets out for twenty five thousand. I just call that way. Keep all his bluffs in. The up to this point, according to Jason Kuhn, and I ran it by my guy Lucky Chewy Andrew Lichtenberger. I've played this perfectly. The turn is uh, four diamonds, or sorry, four. Sp- four spades so it brings two spades on the board but again I have the second nuts the only thing that can beat me is 10-8 and he's never three betting 10-8 off he's rarely three betting 10-8 suited and he bets big on the turn big bets 50,000 I have about 125,000 behind and now there is a question do I want to get it all in right there and hope that He's not bluffing that he has aces, kings, queens, or he got crazy unlucky and flopped a set of sevens or nines. Uh, Or do I want to, again, slow play the hand because I'm so clearly ahead and just call, and that way he can still, if he misses, or he can bluff the river and I can call. I decide, you know what, there's two spades out here now. I don't want to get in a weird spot. Also, let's, you know, where... I just call, a you know, the eight of spades rolls off on the river, and now two spades beat me, any ten beats me, a lot of stuff beats me. I just, I want to get it in right now, and if he has aces, kings, or queens, he might have to call. If he has a set of sevens or nines, he's snap calling, and if he folds, I'm now way above starting stack. If he calls, I'm close to the chip leader of the tournament. And I'm super, like, so I take my time, then I go all in. He snap calls, and I am so happy. I'm like, this is amazing. I have the second nuts. You've snap called, so you're not on a draw. You might be, you're probably drawing to one out. You have pocket sevens, pocket nines, maybe aces or kings, in which case you have one or two outs. And I roll over my jacks because he called me, and he rolls over. 10-8 of spades. The only hand that can beat me. And the other two, the two pros straddling me, uh, Seth Davies and uh, David Peters both audibly gasped. And I almost fainted. I was like, oh, I was so happy. I was the chip leader. And now, unless the board pairs, I'm out. And I looked up at the board And at that point, 57 people had entered the tournament, and 56 were still remaining. I'm like, oh, I'm going to be the second person out of here, and I need a 4, 7, 9, or jack to come, and it comes the 5 of diamonds, and I collect my belongings, and I leave. And that was my experience in the super high roller or 50k. So that's poker, ladies and gentlemen. 
And the next day before I interviewed Kuhn, Kuhn came up to me to his credit. And he was like, and he was like, Hey man, heard what happened to you. Want you to know every single guy in this room goes broke on that hand. And that made me feel a little bit better, but not really. I was like, oh, well, I guess. And I had to. Then I called your mom and was like, uh, free, I guess now for the rest of the day because it didn't go. <laughs> supposed to be a two. I've mean, been down there for multiple days, and that was that. But that's poker, I suppose. There's a poker story for people that care about it. All right, Demonte, go ahead. Wait. So there was a. We found a clip of you having a conversation between maybe yeah. one of those guys that you just mentioned. I assume Phil Hellmuth um, and Jason Kuhn. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, so for those watching on YouTube, I think we're going to play it up here soon. And for yeah, let's play. On the pot. Oh, let's do it. I think what you said there in this old school, new school kind of debate that people try to have is an overlooked upon point, which is there is a lot of the current generation that says, ah, the old school crushers yeah. couldn't make it in this generation. And yeah. that may or may not be true for some. Yeah. For, but the flip side is never discussed, and I think that is absolutely right. And yeah. I want to get both of your guys' take on it. The idea that the new school guys, if they were put in that environment, absent of the current tools, absolutely. Could, they have, could they have had that level of success? I happen to think abs- for some certainly, sure. but all absolutely not. And I don't think that dynamic is ever really considered. So that was the old school, new school poker discussion. Go ahead, Demonte. Oh, I was going to ask if it was a basketball discussion, like old school versus new school. Oh. They always say LeBron couldn't well, hang well, back then. Right, it's so it's very uh, it, it's very similar. It, it is, and it is the old school guys saying my era is the toughest and the new school guys saying that, no, actually, it's harder now. In poker, it is undeniable. The best players ever are playing right now, but that does not mean the players from a previous era – could not succeed right now. And some of them, like Helmuth and Seidel, Negranu, some of them are. And they've just adjusted. Their, Helmuth hasn't adjusted much, but the other guys have. Um, all right, that's probably enough poker. That, by the way, appreciate the World Series of Poker bringing me down, and I hope to do more stuff with them. All right, Demonze, what are the listener questions? AJ, uh, AJ Fig heard. Yeah. I heard you talk about two and Purdy said we don't know Mahomes would be great in other situations. Look at how, look at how he looks this year without a good receiving core. How did he look last year without with the same receiving core, guys? He won the league again. Just try to use critical thought, please. Please try to use critical thought. What I said was the the difference makers when they have great weapons, they set records and win championships like Mahomes when his first few years in the league. And the difference makers, when they don't, you are still a true contender by virtue of them being themselves, which is how last year the Chiefs with Juju Smith-Schuster as their number one receiver were the highest scoring team in the NFL, had the most yards of any team in the NFL, scored 38 points in the Super Bowl with a quarterback with one leg. Just use critical thinking. That's all I'm asking. Like, just don't, A.J. Fig, you you're you probably have friends and colleagues that work with you that watch this podcast that are now going to know you're an idiot. Like, come on, be better, buddy. All right, next. If Anthony Kane asks... Hey, Nick, do you think the Giants are going to have a quarterback controversy next year with Jones and DeVito? A thousand percent. No, but again, since we're – no, so here's the thing. No, because they paid Jones. But again, we yeah, had – these are all the same type of arguments we had about Daniel Jones too. It's like, oh, when are you going to give Daniel Jones his credit? And now it's like, oh, what about Tommy DeVito? Maybe it's that Brian Dable is pretty good with quarterbacks and can get blood from a stone from quarterbacks. No, I don't think Tommy DeVito's great. I think the coaching's great. I didn't think Daniel Jones was great. I thought the coaching was great. Next. All right, Brian Dorm- uh, Dormandy says, uh, Hi, Nick. Yeah. We are coming to the end of Trevor's rookie contract. With how things have been going, do you see the potential for him to move on to another team for better opportunities? Um, No, absolutely not. That'll never happen. He'll sign this summer. He and Dak will sign the two richest quarterback contracts in NFL history, aside from the Mahomes deal. Pardon me. That's just how it's going to work. The teams don't lose their franchise quarterback. No chance. Um, Next. All right. Jason Schrank said, hey, Nick, love the show. Newly minted dad over the weekend. What's your best piece of advice? I the, Don't freak out. 
the I'm going to take advice la my buddy Laszlo gave me and give to you. Never met an adult ever in my life that pees their pants and can't speak. Everybody figures it out, so don't worry about the timing of it. Like they ever was like, oh, is your kid potty trained yet? Oh, when did they start talking? When did they start walking? You meet a lot of adults that are crawling around on the ground and peeing on themselves and can't form words. No, everybody figures it out. So that's first piece of advice to make you feel that's via Laszlo to make you feel a little more calm. The other one is no matter how overwhelmed you think, and I don't know anything about your life, Jason, but I guarantee you it is a mathematical certainty. There are people out there right now less sophisticated than you, less smart than you, with less money than you that are raising successful kids, that are being successful parents. So no matter your circumstances, people have done it with those circumstances or worse, and the kids have worked out fine. Like, don't put too much pressure on yourself. And then the last one is just, just be excited to l meet them. And uh, a piece of advice from John Lopez, my old radio partner, uh, who had kids much older than mine. Uh, and he said, every age is the best age. And that part is true. Every age is the best age. Like, you, you're you sad when they move to a different phase, but that you then get to experience that new phase, which is the best. Like, I, when, at right now, my favorite stage of Demonze is the one he's in right now and with Diora it's the one she's in right now with Deanna it's the one she was in a couple of years ago to be honest she's kind of a pain in the ass right now but she'll get better she'll get back on track um but uh I kid your baby sister um but they're and in the moment like they're all they're all the best uh I hope that's advice uh Gabe says there is I'm not going to say the number he says but he says there's a toddler number that is not the best age. <laughs> yeah, but you'll toddler miss it number. when it's gone, but then it'll be back. Um, All right, Demonze, answer that last one. Javon Washington, uh, Demonze, uh, what kind of hoodie is that? This is a scotch and soda hoodie. Uh, I'm hearing I'm hearing talks about them being closed down. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I don't even know if there's a scotch and soda out here. I don't know where you live either, but they've probably got a shop online or something. But, yeah, long story short, scotch and soda. Uh, um, so I don't, so the, I don't think, so the Dutch fashion retailer filed a, for bankruptcy in April before being acquired by Blue Star Alliance. Um, so they closed several stores, but I don't think they closed for good and they're still available online. All right. Long show, but very good show. I got to run. Demand's a great work. Uh, 200th episode on Thursday. Excited for it. Might have a special guest. See you guys then. What's right. Hey, it's Nick Wright. Thank you so much for watching. Please do us a favor. Click subscribe. It helps my ego. And demonze has got a financial bonus writing on a number of YouTube subscribers. So help him out. And also, click the bell. I don't know what the bell does, but they tell me to tell you to click the bell. And your audio listeners, people that have commutes, drives, whatever it is, subscribe to the podcast as well, wherever you get the podcast. Same show, just, you know, just in your ears instead of through your eyes. All that. Check it out. Appreciate y'all.